there. I'm going to talk specifically about fixed pitch props. All right, so watch the Sensenich video. I say Sensenich. It's obviously Sensenich. Like, guys in church. Uh, let's see. Wood props. Well, that's the OG of props. They were originally made of wood. Oh, I even wrote that. Originally, all props were wood. Props were wood. They are made of made of several laminations of straight grain wood. So laminations where you take one and glue it to the next and glue it to the next. Straight grain obviously refers to the wood. You'll get a whole bunch of stuff in wood class. It's getting harder and harder to find good straight grain wood. Trees don't grow like they used to. Uh, and of course it's finished to correct size and shape. There is the tip fabric. Uh, it's usually not applied to the whole thing like they showed in the movie. It's usually just the outboard. Tip fabric applied. To outboard. 12 to 15 inches roughly. Uh, this does two things. This reinforces the thin tips and provides environmental protection. Then they are varnished. And metal tipping is applied. To the leading edge. To. I think there's a couple of Q&A questions in regards to this metal tipping. I'll let you get caught up here. <clears throat> But wood props do have some advantages over metal props. Uh, I'd say primarily they're a lot lighter. So if weight is an issue, then that's a really good thing. <clears throat> and it usually is in an airplane. Um, they're cheaper than, than uh, I think, metal propellers these days. The, the downside from a mechanic is they're a bit of a maintenance pig. Uh, I had one customer who had, he actually took my advice, which I guess was nice, but a little too much. Um, he had a Ronca Chief with a wood propeller on it, and, and uh, the airplane lived out in a shade hangar, so it was exposed to elements out on the river. And uh, he had a real nice cover made, you know, like boat canvas, slid over it, so it kind of protected it. But the problem with wood propellers is they, they change with moisture content. So you have to be real careful not to crush them. In fact, I've seen some mechanics just destroy them. Um, when, you're, when you're bolting it on, you, know, you got a bolt pattern and, and the torque isn't real high on wood props. And so I've seen them, number one, 
um, screw up the torque by just going, well, I'll just go to 4313 or something and just, you know, well, let's see, it takes a 916 wrench, so it must be a 916 bolt. And then they start with one and just, uh, just you know, <clears throat> just torquing the crap out of it. And eventually it's like, hey, this won't torque. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And you pull off the plate and it's like one part of the blade is just crushed in and, you know, it's garbage at that point. You just throw it away. There's nothing you can do about it. So the torque on these is very specific. It's not a 4313 thing. It is a very specific Sensnitch torque for wood propellers. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember I, oh, I think it was 125 inch pounds. It's light for a propeller. Cause I remember using my little torque wrench all the time, not my big one. And uh, so when there's a lot of moisture in the air, the wood is gonna swell, which makes that torque tighter, which can crush the wood. And then if, if you left it and then the wood dried out, then you've crushed it and now you've got space in there and it'll wobble, wear out the bolt holes and now you throw the prop away again. So he would have me go out and uh, he flew it his plane a lot, but it was like, he just kind of had it on his calendar once a month. He'd give me a call, retorque the prop. So I go out there, just take all the bolts off, let it set for a little bit, put it back on, retorque it. Prop lasted all the way up until the time uh, well, sadly, he, he died, <laughs> sold the plane, and that guy ran it right up top of BMW. So that uh, made toothpicks out of uh, that. A lot of toothpicks. They were really nice toothpicks. Too. <clears throat> uh, all right. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, you got to, uh, and uh, oh, yeah, and you have to be careful how you set them. Like, we always set the wood props this way. If you set them one down or one up, moisture, in theory, can run to the lower lower blade and cause an imbalance in the blades. So if you did leave a blade sitting and moisture kind of worked its way down to the lower blade, how do you fix that? <laughs> I guess let it run that way until they all dry out. So, uh, Let's see. Varnish, yeah, the varnish wears out. You have to re-varnish, but you have to be very careful when you re-varnish or repaint any propellers because if you put too much varnish on one side, you're back out of balance. So he's got to put the same amount of varnish on both sides. All right, so that metal tipping is applied to the leading edge. The metal tipping is because the wood can't handle the abuse that a propeller gets. And, you know, I just, it makes me sad to look at this beautiful propeller right here with not a single blemish on it. And I look at my propeller, which looks like I hate it uh, because of the environment that I fly in and load. I have little rocks everywhere. It just beats the hell out of these propellers. So I'm constantly sanding and, and trying to repaint mine, keep it looking nice. Um, but so wood props and composite, they'll have metal tipping, which will be applied to the leading edge. Which There we go. There's metal tipping right here. And I think there's some Q&As about this. So it does have some holes in here. They are, as it says, drain holes. And the way this is put on is they um, use screws or nails depending on how much thickness they have. So put the screw in and then they solder over the screw to safety it on there. So you don't really see that there's screws. You just see some little soldered divots going up and down on the prop. So metal tipping, let's see, Met the metal is brass. Brass, stainless, or manel. Uh, protects the leading edge. From rocks, fod, other fod, rain. Um, it is attached with counter sucks, counter sunk. Screws. That's actually one of the countersunk screws. In the thick section, in thick section, I'll try and make it less boring. I can hear that yawn coming. In the thick section. And rivets in the thin. And then the screws or rivets. Or 
safety with solder. And we have small, about number 60. That's pretty small. Holes drilled in the tip, in the middle tip. to allow moisture to escape. I think that's all I got to say about that. All right, talk about metal props. All right, aluminum is the most common. I'm only aware of one prop that's a metal prop that's steel, and that's actually our ground adjustable, the black one right there you guys are working on, that's a steel prop. Um, all the rest of my, oh, if they're metal, they're aluminum. So uh, there's some benefits to aluminum. Benefits. Well, because they're not made of wood, you can make them much thinner. Uh, aluminum props are thinner. They can make them into more efficient airfoils. Uh, better cooling for the engine will provide better cooling. <coughs> better cooling. Better engine cooling, obviously. Uh, due to airfoil shape at the hub. If you look at the difference between, well, that doesn't really count because it's constant speed, but a fixed pitch, how it's shaped near the hub versus how much thicker a wood prop is, you kind of see that and you go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, let's see. And I would say to some extent less maintenance. Although I would say that probably metal props are far more neglected because they just seem to be more robust. So if people take advantage of that situation. They don't have them overhauled. They don't paint them. They don't take good care of them. Um, and we've mentioned this before. You know, for the most part, as AMPs, there's very little we can do to propellers, and there's probably even less we should do to props. When you you know, it's like I'm going to, one of your projects is to uh, blend out a nick. You know, and that's a very common thing for an AMP to do is blend out a nick. But you really need to go direct to the manufacturer and use the manufacturer. Yeah, 4313 has some stuff and the other ACI give you has got some stuff. But man, there's a lot in those prop books and they're hard to come by uh, and they're expensive books. And so... So they often don't get used. And then we look at 4313 and it's like, oh, blend it out like that. I did it. Yay for me. Well, now I can see that there's a bare spot. I will put some paint on it. It's done. You know, but when you really read the book and it tells you what to do, when you blend or you do anything, you're supposed to then do non-destructive testing on it. You're supposed to put allodyne on it, acid edge, allodyne, a conversion coat. Um, then paint it with some specific, there's a lot to it that just gets not done. So I guess I'll just tell you, be careful with what you're doing. Cause like I said, there was a period of time very recently where 
the bee that the FA got in their bonnet was going after anybody with a polish prop because people didn't realize it. They're like, ah, why spend all this time painting? I just strip the paint off and polish the aluminum. It looks great. I can see it better, you know. And uh, the FA was grounding people for that. It's like, where'd you get that data from? Because it says you got to paint them. It's got to be paint, because that's what the maintenance manual says. Paint. So it says, and I, I believe that probably mostly 100% to do with corrosion. Okay. And and like I said, you know, they're getting to things that, and I barely know about. I just talking to prop shops and, you know, and, and being around them a little bit. They're like, oh no no, you got to overhaul your fixed pitch prop way more often than people are doing it. I mean, you got to take that serious. When you do the engine, you better be doing the prop. The prop should only go this long. I'm like, well, what are you going to do on an overhaul? I mean, it's fixed. I mean, I, you, boy, you take it in and just measure it. And like, no, we actually, we straighten them back out. We reset the angles on everything. They get all off. And they said mostly from people pushing on them, pushing the airplane around. Yeah. So they reset all the angles, which they could do. And then I think one of the most important things is they actually take and they grind off a, le a, a surface layer of the aluminum to relieve stresses that build up in the, in the surface. I'm like, wow, that's a lot. All right, uh, let's see. Well, I probably should have just skipped this one, but we'll talk about part numbers. In fact, I worked with one guy. I don't, this either made him a really good mechanic or a really bad mechanic, but whenever it came down to doing an annual, he would just go up to the engine or the, the propeller. He would write down the, the model number, serial number, anything else was written on the hub, and he'd go in and he'd call the prop shop. Dude, this is what I got. Are there any ADs on it? Anything I got to know? You wouldn't even look up ADs on a prop. I mean, <laughs> go straight to the source. I know, yeah. Um, God, the name of that prop shop, <laughs> it's right there. Um, what are some names of the Bay Area towns that start with an H? Here. That's way up that way. You gotta go. Hayward. Hayward Propeller. Yeah, Hayward Propeller. Pretty sure that's what it is. Nice people. And so if you're gonna be in general aviation, the best thing you can do is get a relationship with a prop shop you trust. That's the hard part. And uh, I don't know, it's Hayward. I'll have to look it up. Um, sounds a little off. But uh, they'll take care of you. Uh, all right, part numbers. Uh, this is uh, actually out of SenseNiche. as an example. So, oh, no, never mind. It's Macaulay, so sorry. <coughs> I'm not doing a sentence. That's what my note says. I should do one. We'll just do one here. Uh, there's really, I think it's three props. We have, obviously, you have the, the sense niche, and you have Macaulay, and you have Hartzell. Those are your, your big ones. Oh, now MT Propeller. Uh, Macaulay, if we had a one, Bravo 90CM7144, like that would be a, a, a part number of one. So we'd have uh, the one Bravo 90 right there. That's the model number. And the CM would be uh, the style. And that style could be something about uh, the mounting or the tip style or something like that. Mounting hole configuration. Little variances within that style. Uh, let's see. The 71, that's where it gets interesting, I think. So we have the model number. Hub style is what I'd call it. 71 is the diameter. And the 44 is a geometric pitch. And the geometric pitch is a what? Theoretical. Theoretical. Movement. Distance. The plane, the plane moves. And one revolution. And one revolution. Oh, you guys got it. <laughs> Measured where? What's that, Dulce? <laughs> She's going to hit me, isn't she?
<laughs> There's nothing I could do about it. <laughs> Would you that you already do? I said you were gonna hit me, and there was nothing I could do about it. I know you could hit me. No. <laughs> well, why would she hurt my feelings like that? No, I'm just sad. All right, uh, let's see. Within the fixed pitch world, which is what we're talking about, um, there are typically different prop versions. Different prop versions allowed for each aircraft. If I want to know what kind of propeller I can install on my aircraft, where would I go look that up? Where? Where, Zach, in your... Where, where? I said call the manufacturer. Call the manufacturer. 1-800-CESSNA? Yeah. He's not wrong. He's <laughs> not wrong. Um, I know I heard the right answer over here. Uh, Google it. Some great forums out there that will answer every question you've ever wanted to know. Right or wrong, you get the answer. Um, the answer is type, certificate, data, sheet. All right, so we had the wood. We're talking about metal props. What kind of plane is that? A forced high wing. You know, I got to thinking about this. For you people with low wings, there would be this great controversy about which is better, a high wing or a low wing. Oh, uh, somebody else made that up? He's right. Yeah, I was thinking, well, God made birds this way, not that. I don't think I have any, I don't, I don't know any low wing birds. When I, when I turn in the pattern, I can keep track of where the strip is. See, I actually prefer people who fly low wing airplanes because I have a high wing airplane. So as long as I'm up and they're down, we see each other. We're going to be just fine. <laughs> just to, yeah, if we swap, well, we're, we're both to blame. So see, it's not just one of our fault. All right, so it's 172. You can tell because it doesn't have cow flaps. And the propeller is a fixed pitch propeller. So that's the only way I can tell. They usually look the same to me. All right, here's a type certificate data sheet off of a 150 that I can tell that you can just really see real easy right there. Uh, I know you haven't looked at a lot of type certificate data sheets, and this isn't the complete one. I think I just cut some pages out of here, but it's for a Cessna 150. And you can see it's a 150, the A, B, C, D, and all the way through the H, and then over here all the way to the M's, 152's. Uh, but anyway, in this particular page right here, for the 150, the first one versions, then the A, B, and C models, how many different engines could we have? One, it would be a? Continental O200, which takes 8087 grade. And the engine for all engine limits, for all operations, what's the maximum we can turn it? 2750, and that produces a whopping 100 horsepower. All right, so well, here's some different propellers. Now I could have prop one, two, or three on here. And so prop number one is a Sensenic 69CK. So how, what's my diameter going to be on that one? Not over 69 inches, not over 69. 69, right there. So they're telling me that the model I want is a 69, right there, the 69 inches. Could we shorten it up a bit? Sure could. Static RPM. What is static RPM? Speed on the brakes, full, Speed on the brakes, full power. Full power, and it had better produce. Not over. And not under 2300. So be nice if they did it the other way around where it was going high to low, but whatever. So no additional tolerance printed, by the way. That's 24-pound propeller located 32 inches forward of the datum, which is probably not. It is. It's a firewall. What well, do you mean by 24 pounds? That's how much it weighs. So this helps you do your weight and balance. So if I took off this Sensnik and I put on a Macaulay, I would know that there's a three pound difference and I could do my weight and balance without having to actually weigh the propeller. All right, or I could put a Macaulay on here. 
um, or an A100. Yeah, see, that doesn't really help me with the, the numbering right there. Um, but uh, between 69 and 67, or this Macaulay right here. Uh, what about the pitch? They're not giving me any pitch information. So I can have any pitch I want? No, no, the 1A100 MCM, uh, 1A100 DCM, is, or the 69CK, no pitch information. So can I have any pitch I want? Does that information come with the, is it like the pop when you receive it? Is it what? It comes with the prop when you receive it from the company? Oh, uh, prop. You got to buy the prop for the airplane. Well. Airplane is the, the airplane manufacturer. This is a Cessna 150 type certificate data sheet. Approved by the FAA. So you got to call Sensenix for that information? You're thinking about it backwards again. Okay. Who made the airplane? Who decided what, air, what prop went on here? Cessna. Now, prop manufacturer would know because they know the answer to this question. But I'm asking you. Call Cessna? All right. <laughs> Should I be Cessna? Should I be one eight hundred Cessna? Tell you the answer. Hello, uh, it says right there, not over twenty four seventy, not under twenty three twenty. There's your pitch information. Who would have thought? They don't care what the pitch is, but your static power. RPM better be at least thirty uh, twenty three twenty, and it better not be more than twenty four seventy. So a person can adjust it as long as it's in between those numbers. Yep. So let's just say, this is exactly what happened to me. I have my Cessna 150, and it just seems so freaking slow. And so I'm worried, why is it so slow? So I go out, well, maybe it's not producing enough power. So I go out and I do a static RPM check, and I get, uh, say, 2,400. 24. So it's kind of on the high side. So what kind of prop do I have? A low pitch. Climb prop. So is it going to go fast? It's going to climb fast and then slow down. So I could have it repitched. And that's exactly what I did. I figured out um, I took the RPM, the. One degree or whatever? Yeah, exactly. One degree will get me this and then figured it out. I don't remember how I did it. I sat down and figured out exactly what that would give me and what the speed would, and I realized, well, I wasn't even worth it. But, um, but that is the point here. If you're, a, if you're a big boy and you have trouble getting off a short field, you're going to want it down here at 2320. You don't weigh a whole lot. You got a long, you're, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I went the other way. You're a fat boy, you want this one. Because they keep putting the numbers backwards on it. Yeah, if you're heavy on a short field, you want to spin up fast. You keep your airplane here, go for a cruise prop. You got 10,000 plus feet to take off in. You'll be fine. Maybe. So, anyway. So, right there. That's, that's our pitch information. So, we have all three props that we could have and the pitch information. You have it repitched. Now, if you have a... Well, it's ground adjustable. We'll get that next week. All right, so prop version. Let me see. There are different prop versions allowed. We're going to look at the TCDS um, prop versions. So we had like two Macaulay's and one cent snitch, right? Um, within each version. Uh, there is a static. RPM tolerance. And remember, we're talking strictly about fixed pitch propellers. This does not count for any other propeller. Ground adjustable, adjustable, pilot adjustable, constant speed, that, throw all that out. The only thing that would stand true with all of this is the type certificate data sheet will tell you what prop you can put on it. 
So, just for the sake of a mental argument, I look up the type certificate data sheet for my aircraft. It says I can have a Macaulay and it gives me this, and it says I can have a heart soul and it gives me that. But I want to put one of those new MT composite propellers on. Supplement to the type certificate. So heart soul comes out or let's say Nick. I want to put a Nick prop on. Yeah. Nick's making props now. Congrats. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, with all the money he makes, he's gonna clean his shirt. Yeah. <laughs> buy some rags <laughs> so he doesn't have to do I this. Who needs a rag? No, no final wipe it. Uh, that's right. I worked in one place with a guy who insisted everybody wore white coveralls. I'm like, I don't wear coveralls. Yeah. Um, that's what I said. That's, gonna be no for me. Yeah, that's what I said. That's going to be a no for me. I'll work here, but I'm wearing pants and a shirt. Anyway, so Nick makes props, and I love Nick's props because they're the best out there, but it's not a type certificate for my aircraft. But Nick was nice enough when he built his props. He went to the FAA and he got a type certificate for my aircraft. So. Nick will sell me the prop for 20000 and the type certificate for another $1,000 on top of it. Usually the STC comes with the paperwork. Where the, I mean, the paperwork comes with the prop. You don't usually pay extra for it. But So you follow? So if somebody makes something and they get approved for your airplane, well, then you just get the type certificate and install it. So you can pull that type certificate and sell it to the people? Yes. Oh, you mean like if I bought the prop and he gave me the STC, could I then sell you the STC? No, like you own the rights to the He does. He does. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whoever gets approved. Well, okay. It's, that's kind of a whole different topic because then you can get into um, previously approved data. So there was a period of time when we could get field approvals. Like, you know, Nick made the prop, but hey, he built it for home builds. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, the same engine on that home build, so it'll work. So I'd buy the prop and go to the FAA and say, I know that it's not approved for my airplane and it wasn't, it's for home builds, but I got a Cessna, but I really want to use it. And uh, here's a bottle of scotch and a pile of money. Now, Gosh, yeah. So you call out the FAA and you say, this is what I want to do. And they'd look at it and go, eh, okay, I'll give you a field approval on that. And they would stamp it and approve it on your uh, 337. And Oh, yeah, it was, it was great back oh in those days. Um, now, once I had my 337, all of you could call me and do the same thing. Kevin, I want to copy the 337. Jeez. So I just make it, copies go out, and you're like, all right, here's my previously approved data. And you go to the next FA guy, it's like, the hell? Hmm. Uh, it's on him. So it's, it's just. Who's <laughs> Kevin? <laughs> Not me, though. Yeah, so it was uh, whoever the FA guy was. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, you can give away with all kinds of stuff. Uh, okay, so within each, there's a static RPM tolerance. Let's see. Uh, let me see. Props. Props are often uh, pitched by about two inches difference to create three possibilities. So we'd have a climb prop, which would be high RPM. That would give you the highest RPM of the chart. Uh, we'd have a cruise prop. That would be the low RPM. And we would have a, a, a mid-range, or all-around. That would be the middle RPM. So each section would be two or three inches different? Yeah. Okay. Two inches, two inches, two inches. So I, I don't know what it would actually be. Let's just trying to think. What's the one over there? How many inches is that? It's about a 20 degree. Who did the, how many inches was that, the metal prop we have over there? 69? No, no, it's like a 54 inch uh, pitch. 62 inch pitch? All right, so if we did that, we would have, we could go 
62. Um, then we go low RPM. That'd be more pitch. That'd be, oops, that'd be 60, 64, and 62 if I did that right. Yeah, inches as an example. Mm -hmm. For me, I'd want the mid-range probably, but they didn't ask me. So. Okay, this is one of these really weird things. That's resonant frequencies. The more I learn about resonant frequencies, the more I realize how little I absolutely understand this stuff. It is just so bizarre. And I don't know how they come up with this. I was on a webinar. It's been a long time. And it was some company that produced, uh, I think it was mostly for helicopters. They had transducers all over it. And uh, you're supposed to download your, your actually, I think it's real-time stuff. They monitored this stuff as satellite link. And I think uh, modern aircraft have this uh, now, your uh, transport aircraft. Uh, real-time links with uh, vibration sensors. And so they're picking up frequencies. So you and, to the, to the drag yeah, yeah, okay. So, and, and based upon the frequency that you get, they can tell you exactly what the problem with the helicopter is. Hmm. And then it got into uh, frequencies that we could feel as humans, frequencies we couldn't feel. I want to say with something about the ones we can feel are not dangerous, as dangerous. It's when it starts to get away from where we can feel it that we have major problems. Uh, because we feel very low frequencies. It's the really high ones that, that causes stress. It just goes nuts. And we've already had engines in here. We talked about dynamic counterweights on engines. You know, the third order, uh, you know, my engine, I think, has a, a third order, a fourth order, and two fifth order counterweights. It's like, yeah, they come up with this stuff. Um, the uh, the Rotax engines, uh, believe it or not, the, uh, the uh, prop really isn't connected directly to the gearbox, you know, like a direct link. It's got, I wanna, is it 60 degrees of movement in there? So you could actually move the prop backwards. You're not supposed to move prop backwards on a Rotax, by the way, but uh, if you know what you're doing, you can move it backwards and it just slips. It's like, it doesn't move the engine at all. Then you can go back the other way and then it engages the engine. It's like, and so yeah, they have these big triangles kind of inside the gearbox that, that, it'll, that and that's because of the frequency of the engine and the propeller and the gearbox, they don't like to, they got to separate it all out, otherwise it kind of eats itself up. So, so that's what they did. So, um, but for the most part, you know, we're talking about legacy air aircraft, Cessnas and Pipers and things like that, with these metal propellers, and there are ranges of RPM and propeller combinations that just don't work. And so the solution is, you know, you build an engine. You uh, design the airframe, you buy the prop, you put it together, you find out that the resonant frequency at a certain range is really bad and will cause destruction. So what do they do? They just placard it. And so that's one of the funny things about aviation. You know, it's like once we discover something's really bad, as long as you placard it and tell people it's bad, then you're fine. You know, so, right, in-op equipment, it's like, oh, that thing doesn't work. Well, if you put a sticker that says in-op, you're fine, but don't leave it, you know, so people know. So you'll see in some aircraft, you'll get in, and you'll see a, a yellow arc or red arc in a really bizarre place on, our, on the tachometer. You're like, well, wait a minute. It's like you're okay to be here, but not here. And then over here is okay. And that's exactly what it is. There's some RPM ranges on some propeller combinations with engines. You can go through it to the other side. You can go through it to this side, but you cannot be lingering in that area. So resonant frequencies. Uh, so metal props are more subject to some metal props. I wrote metal props are subject to resonant frequencies. Obviously, to some extent, wood props also composite because a composite is really a wood prop for the most part. There's wood in there. They're subject to it too. Um, but we're talking about metal props. Metal, metal props are subject. So I would say kind of all props are. It's just, it just seems to apply to metal more than anything. Are subject to resonant frequencies. Um, these frequencies um, 
may cause excessive vibration. Uh, vibration and even lead and even lead to loss of aircraft vis-a-vis -vis loss of part of the propeller which then causes the aircraft crash. An unscheduled rapid disassembly. Some engine slash prop combinations. have RPM range restrictions. Like example, avoid continuous operation between 2000 and 2250. So that's like an example. Um, let's see. You may have an, a colored arc. We'll say a colored arc on the tack like yellow for cautionary, uh, red would be a critical vibration, and of course you have a, another red arc for your max RPM. The most common failure associated with this, with the vibration, uh, common failure with vibration is tip loss. Oh, uh, that's just part of the just part of the propeller. By the way, that's why I don't stand in line with props. Prop spinning like this, I don't stand there and slide down it because, man, I'm always afraid something's going to come flying off that thing. I don't think you'd see it. You just kind of wake up, Dad. <laughs> if you're lucky, you won't feel it. You just wake up. Yeah, what was that? If you're lucky, you will feel it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll buy that. If you're lucky, you'll feel it. Uh, let me see. Let's tip loss. Yeah, from fatigue crack. Um, you can also have failure of, also, failure of spinner or bulkheads that hold the spinner on. And what you want to talk about stupid expensive stuff is spinner parts, bulkheads for spinners. You know, plate that holds the spinner on. I mean, you could be looking at a couple grand. Spinners, these are going to be... Um, yeah, I was working with the, the company in Sacramento. I told you guys about the, the, the 182, and I had to go in there to change out the counterweight, and the engine ran really bad, and it kept throwing the belt, and I told you all that story. I kept, when I got on the 182 and I started up, I'm like, damn, this thing is like rough. It's just so bad. And I called the owner, and he got in it. He's like, oh, my God, what'd you do? It runs so much better than it used to. I'm like, it was worse than this? He's like, yeah, it was worse. I'm like, there's something really wrong, man. You got to have this prop balance. So, he, he, you know, Kept throwing a belt, and I'd say, well, did you get the prop balance? No, no, yeah, I get it. So I finally got the prop balance. The guy came out to balance the prop, said, I can't balance this prop. It is so out of balance. It's the max amount of weight that I can use. And that, by the way, that's what they were doing with uh, Larry's plane the other day. So it's a dynamic balance. You actually run the engine. 
you have a sensor on it and a little photo sensor so it knows which blade is going by, a little computer, and then you shut it down and say add X number of ounces to you know, some particular clocking on here. And so the guy said, it's beyond the weight that I'm allowed to add. And so he said, ah, you know, um, it was a, a threaded Macaulay, which will mean something next week to you. So he thought, I'll just buy a new prop. Uh, the poor guy who ordered the prop, when he called Macaulay, said, okay, the spinner and bulkhead that he currently has will work with the new prop, right? The guy's like, absolutely. He's like, are you sure? Yes, we are sure. New prop shows up, 10000 no, it's actually $12,000. They go to bolt it up, and it doesn't line up with the spinner and bulkhead. So he calls Macaulay up, so it doesn't fit. Well, yeah, you got to order the whole set. He's like, you told me. Oh, sorry. Um, all right, well, how much is the spinner and bulkhead now? 12000 <laughs> So it's the same price as the prop. So it's, instead of a $12,000 prop, it was really a $24,000 prop. Um, yeah. And that's why you get a fixed pitch wood drop. <laughs> <laughs>